Um, thank you very much, uh, Catherine, for introducing me and us so nicely. Um, I need some seconds to start my presentation here. And we already heard the key um, word, key um, concept for today, alternative futures, um, which I also have uh, on my uh, title slide. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and also from my part, a very warm welcome to this first evening session of Technospheres Times Knowledge. Is that the right, uh, how to um, pronounce uh, the, the motto of the evening? I, I think so. Um, tonight, I have the great pleasure to briefly introduce you to a field and a method um, of an oftentimes vigorously cont contested mode of scientific inquiry, the scenario mode. This mode of hypothesizing possible futures now exists for about six decades. As an effect, it is a futurology which first and foremost carries with it a lot of history. My task for the next 20 minutes is to boil down this history of the scenario mode to some fundamental ingredients, and I hope that this will give you an orientational framework for the things to come, which is first to Peter Gallison's cinematic essay that will follow after my talk, and second to the ensuing panel discussion about today's status of scenarios with uh, Peter, Claire, and Sander. My presentation, presentation, as you heard, consists of five parts. The first is um, quite extensive, um, and the four um, uh, other parts are more snapshot-like historical cases which will um, be in the second half of my talk. In the short announcement to this talk in the um, HKV program, I stated that scenarios are mediators of crisis. I think that this already holds true for the historical background upon which scenario techniques emerged. And this brings us to the first of my five scenes in the history of the scenario mode, which is um, the unthinkable. The seeds of scenario think, uh, techniques and thinking were planted in the late 1940s when the futurist Hermann Kahn, then a young defense analyst at Rand Corporation, started telling brief stories to describe the many possible ways that nuclear weapons technology might be used by hostile nations. For this, the magazine Scientific American described Mr. Kahn as, quote, thinking the unthinkable. And Kahn embraced this characterization gleefully for the first in a number of best-selling books with rather provocative titles, as we see here. Near Rand's offices, at that time still located in Santa Monica, Kahn enjoyed the relaxed atmosphere of interdisciplinary thought in this iconic think tank. At Rand, leading so-called civil defense intellectuals from various academic disciplines hung out with screenwriters and movie makers. Um, and the former, like Kahn, started thinking in unconventional ways to create scenarios for the nuclear wars to come. And meanwhile, the other, uh, or one of the latter, uh, especially Stanley Kubrick, used Herman Kahn as a model for Dr. Strangelove. Uh, although the congenial, uh, congenial actor Peter Sellers lacked any visible um, resemblance to the real uh, world Khan. And it was screenwriter Leo Rosten who suggested the name Scenarios for Khan's storytelling exercises about nuclear warfare. Scenarios, though, were invented at a time of crisis of strategic planning in the shadow of the bomb. Herman Khan writes, when the atom bomb was developed, many scholars, military professionals, in, and informed laymen believed that strategy and tactics, as they understood them, had come to an end. The inevitable result of nuclear war would be mutual annihilation. Strategy was irrelevant, since it could not be an objective of strategy to bring about the destruction of the nation. Atomic war thus became unthinkable, both literally and figurat figuratively." End of quote. To fill this intellectual void, Kahn began to imagine nuclear war scenarios as collections of short stories. These were based on a systematic analysis of relevant factors and possible alternative ways of action. He termed this the future now thinking. 
His stories, for example, distinguished targeting objectives or surviving situations, thereby challenging the doctrine of all-out mutual annihilation. Combined with game theory, this opened up a field of strategic thinking of different escalatory processes and the possible means of control in the nuclear age. As a consequence, Khan gained euphorical monikers, such as Super Khan, but also deeply critical nicknames, such as Second Strike Santa Claus. Together with uh, Anthony Wiener, Khan defined scenarios, quote, as hypothetical sequences of events constructed for the purpose of focusing attention on causal processes and decision points. Scenarios deal with the, quote again, causation, initiation, cause, and termination of possible future crises and wars. To enrich these narratives, the scenario planners at RAND, on the one hand, employed qualitative creativity techniques, such as role-playing games, brainstorming, or mental models as input. For Khan, it thereby was essential to work with mixed groups of experts from different fields, and even with non-experts, to induce a kind of thinking outside of the box. On the other hand, the scenario planners included quantitative data to describe certain initial states or boundaries of possible causes of events. The management, management technique of operations research, OR, first developed in World War II for creating and evaluating counter strategies to German submarine warfare, provided for adequate styles of representation. OR's diagrammatic techniques and flowcharts of depicting and identifying structures and flows in complex organizational contexts, combined with empirical data, also provided the grounds for quantification and metamatization of certain chains of events. Such quantification is essential to the relevance of scenarios. The challenge lies in realizing how, when, and why the underlying models linked with them um, can hide assumptions and constrain thinking rather than refine it. All these three methods, creativity techniques, empirical data, and flowcharts and decision trees, worked as complements to the narrative short storytelling. The resulting scenarios would give the involved researchers a sense of the character of most of the major branching points of a process, which could then be explored. This exploration, consequently, again took on the form of narratives. Quite consistently, um, Kant's publications of the 1970s, after having extended scenario techniques from the military context to fields like socio-economic research and, um, and other fields, and professionally having moved on from RAND Corporation to the Hudson Institute, had titles like you see it here, the next 200 years or the year 2000. It is clear from these characterizations that a scenario is not a forecast in the sense of a description of a relatively unsurprising projection of the present. Neither it is a vision that is a desired future. Scenarios were not designed to describe the most probable or necessarily, necessarily fairly likely causes of events. A scenario, rather, is a well-worked answer to the question, what can conceivably happen? Or what would happen if? Thus, it differs from either a forecast or a vision, both of which tend to conceal risks. The scenario, in contrast, makes risk management possible. It helps to sharpen up strategies, draw up plans for the unexpected, and keep a lookout in the right direction and on the right issues. As synthetic histories, based on the specific Eigenzeiten of narratives or role-playing games, they open up a course to include all sorts of unreasonable behavior or contingent events, or as Kahn put it, of bizarre actions, or to put it short, for the unthinkable. However, no single scenario is of great value alone. Not before a large number of varied, 
and often mutually exclusive scenarios are used together, they prove useful. As an outcome, we can put down at least three characteristics of the scenario mode so far. That is, first, tell stories that are memorable, yet changeable and disposable. Second, add numbers to stories. And third, focus on multiple possible future processes, not a static image of the future. Okay, we keep that in mind. Come to the second part. But scenario writing is not only a, pl a planning instrument, it is also an effective learning tool. Scenarios are powerful in challenging existing paradigms and assumptions, especially for those who are involved in the scenario generation. And this brings us to the second historical example. In 1965, Royal Dutch Shell put into service what it called the Unified Planning Machinery, or UPM. UPM was a computer-driven system meant to bring more discipline to the company's cash flow planning. This kind of rational, model-based financial forecasting was very much en vogue in the 1960s. But before long, Shell's top executives realized that many of the commitments they had to make extended well beyond UPM's six years time horizon. And even within that horizon, UPM tended to get a lot wrong. So in the early 1970s, they shut down this machine system and switched to human intelligence. From 1967 onwards, and led by Ted Newland, Hank Alkema, and Pierre Wack, Shell started a scenario planning group. The team focused on telling plausible stories about how the wider business context of Shell might develop. And as an outcome, the group would envision key developments of an eventful decade of oil crisis and economic turmoil ahead of time, pushing Shell to be the second largest oil company at the end of the 1970s. However, Shell-style scenario planning has neither been about predicting the future. Um, Shell valued the scenario mode for its ability to provide vital links between organizational processes, such as strategy making, innovation, risk management, public affairs, and leadership development inside the company. It helped breaking the habit ingrained in most corporate planning of assuming that the future will look much like the present. As unthreatening stories, scenarios enable Shell executives to open their minds to previously inconceivable or imperceptible developments. They were designed to break the business-as-usual circles. From an assessment of this more inward-bound perspective of scenario building in Shell's Futures project, we can add three more significant characteristics of the scenario mode to our list. Ah, I've got the uh, two of the three guys here. Forgot that slide. And um, these characteristics are fourth, focus on plausibility, not probability. During the early years of experimentation, Newland, Alkema, and Wack encouraged the team to consider any scenario as long as it could not be rendered implausible through logical reasoning. Later, they decided that this approach generated too many scenarios to be effective and implemented an upper limit on cases. Fifth, balance between relevance and challenge. Scenarios do not only have to encompass possible future ruptures and bifurcations, but also have to be relevant for the decision makers they are developed for. And sixth, manage disagreement as an asset. Under Shell's earlier decentralized structure, scenarios provided a common learning culture, helping create a shared view of the world and refresh the strategic agenda. As Shell as a company became more centralized, Scenarios provided a way to manage disagreement about group strategy um, or priorities and helped disturb the business as usual view that tends to result from wishful thinking or the linear exploration of current trends. This brings us to third example, um, which is a contemporary to the Shell approach. It was far more rigidly based on a mathematical and quantitative modeling approach, 
um, than the mixed strategies developed at Shell, Rand Corporation, and the Hudson Institute. Nevertheless, it became maybe the most prominent multiplicator for a certain style of scenario planning. In 1972, and you all know that example, Dennis Meadows and others published The Limits to Growth based on world dynamics, a computational model developed at the MIT by computing pioneer J.W. Forrester. It took up the first integrative long-term analysis of reciprocal effects between population growth, resource depletion, food supply, capital investment, and pollution in one general model of the future of the world, or the futures of the world. It was also based on the um, aforementioned operation uh, research tradition, now enhanced by the communications and control approaches of cybernetics. Heavily relying on various feedback loops, Forrester christened this modeling approach systems analysis. His world model comprised about 100 different input factors and their interrelations and played and plotted out a formerly unconceivable variety of different future developments resulting from particular choices of action at particular times. But starting with its publication, the model had been severely criticized as an ill-informed computer game which lacked input data and was based on wrong assumptions, or to cite the common phrase used by computer scientists for the scheme, garbage in, garbage out. However, the rather catastrophic scenarios of world dynamics stimulated a widespread discussion on the effects of industrialization and sensibilized large parts of a worldwide audience for more durable and sensible modes of industrial and societal development. And we see here a few of like, the possible futures that were plotted and printed by the by the program, just to give you an idea. And move on to part four. Our fourth historical example connects with uh, a skepticism about computer-based scenario planning and an analysis which we find in many reactions to the limits to growth. It dates 10 years later and comes from pop culture in this case. Many of you will also know this example. It is the mighty no-red computer of John Badham's movie War Games from 1983. However, and maybe not purely coincidentally, in 1983, the US military also had started the first intermediate running model of the so-called RAND Strategic Assessment Center, a computerized system for military multi-scenario generation and analysis. The artificially intelligent computer in war games shows quite similar capabilities to the real-world RAND system. The only problem is that it stops acting as a tool in the movie and starts taking command itself. And let me show you now three minutes of the final sequence of this movie. Learn, goddammit. Drawing more and more power from the rest of the system. Nine numbers. Ten, it's got the code, it's gonna launch.
Greetings, Professor Falcon. Hello, Joshua. Strange game. The only winning move is not to play. What we have seen here is a uh, computer which has thought through all of uh, the Khan-like attempts on the military unthinkable and has come to an interesting decision. There are games without a winner, and the solution then is rather not to play at all. Okay, last um, example. Since this solution, as a matter of fact, might be the only uh, one to secure any future in the face of atomic warfare, it rather does not apply for many other futuristic contexts. This brings us very briefly to the fifth and last example, which is more likely a possible transition to our later discussion. Since the mid-1990s, that is, with the advent of more and more powerful computers and with the possible possibility to integrate more and more so-called big data into computational models, um, it seems that a lot of the skepticism about computer-based scenario planning has vanished. The IPCC set of climate models has become ever more fine-grained since Al Gore's scissor lift presentation in his movie An Unconvenient Truth of 2006. These now begin to integrate also regional climate change, uh, changes into the scenarios, for example. And from 2011 to 13, a large EU-funded uh, uh, funding scheme project called Future ICT, ICT stands for Information and Communication Technology, even outlined plans for installing a so-called social supercomputer. This was designed to connect all sorts of data into, quote, one large knowledge collider with the deliberate allusion to the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva. Even if the project has not been funded in the end, it envisioned that the complexity of today's social, political, and economic systems could not be conceived anymore uh, of by humans, but that only novel techno-social nervous systems, and you have the exhibition um, in this house here, um, only novel techno-social nervous systems could provide for the real-time feeling of developing crisis. And its project papers from the future ICT stated that only with the help of data analysis, computer simulation, and advanced data visualization, viable multi-dimensional scenarios could be generated and evaluated. Thus, where early scenario techniques mainly focused on human intellect, creativity, and storytelling, today's strategies, again, put data-driven approaches, approaches into the center, with computer simulations calculating various alternative futures as dynamic chains, chains of events. The ICT approach weaves in the human factor quite differently. First, as model builders and programmers. Second, as data providers and uh, uh, people participating in social networks. And third, as interpreters in possible crisis observatories. However, for the futures of the scenario mode itself, the question remains whether it is not becoming harder and harder to think outside of the box if its intelligence more and more relies on black boxes, black boxes like this. And yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. And we might proceed with these questions further in the discussion. Thanks.